Magandang hapon po sa inyong lahat. Good afternoon, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the book launch of Between Celebration and Critique, Snapshots from 500 Years of Philippine Christianity. It's a very timely book, authored by no less than Father Jose Mario Francisco, SJ, one of the leading theologians in the Philippines today. It's my privilege to be moderating our launch today. My name is Dr. Jail Cornelio. I'm a sociologist of religion. I work on religion and politics in contemporary Philippines. We want this launch, ladies and gentlemen, to be a conversation. We will hear from Father Mario and esteemed colleagues who I shall be introducing shortly to you all. Thus, I want to encourage you to be participative to be as interactive as possible. Many of you are joining us via Facebook Live. Magadang hapon po sa inyong lahat. We are live, I believe, on the Ateneo University Press's Facebook page. Also cross-posted on the Ateneo de Manila University's Facebook page. I encourage you all, my friends, to please share this uh, link with um, other people whom you think would benefit from this uh, conversation, from this book launch. I believe many of you are fascinated by contemporary Christianity. And it's so, and so it's in that light that I think this book, Between Celebration and Critique, is a very timely publication for all of us. We all know, of course, that la last year, we celebrate our 500th anniversary, 500 years of Philippine Christianity. And many it was not, well, people welcomed it, obviously, the church welcomed it. But at the same time, we also know that many questions were raised about it. How exactly do we celebrate? And I think the title of the book is very fitting, Between Celebration and Critique. 
it's a nice intervention. The pages of this book, I feel, you know, as, as I have already read many of its chapters, are the pages of this book are a very nice intervention, you know, in the middle of these two uh, positions or attitudes towards the 500th anniversary of the church or of Christianity in the Philippines. And then finally, I also wanted to say that this is a timely publication because we all know uh, the elections are coming up and religion plays a very important role in the, our democracy, in the elections, um, and it's not just the Catholic Church behind, um, behind the scenes. We know that many other religious groups are also playing a very significant role. Ladies and gentlemen, please stay tuned because we will be announcing a special discount promo for Between Celebration and Critique later in our program. I believe many of you still don't have a copy. It would be nice to grab a copy with a discount at a discounted rate. So, ano magiging programa natin sa hapon na ito? We will have Father Mario, the author himself, to give us an overview of the book. And then afterwards, we will have discussions from esteemed colleagues, uh, theologians, social scientists, uh, scholars, religious studies scholars, who will offer their thoughts about uh, this book. Let's begin. Simulan natin sa author mismo ng libro ito. Father Jose Mario Francisco S.J., or Father Mario as we call him, has been a professor of theology and cultural studies at the Loyola School of Theology of the Ateneo de Manila University for more than four decades. He has also lectured at other academic institutions abroad, among them the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome, and Boston College in Massachusetts, where he received the Thomas Gasson Professorial Chair in 2005 to 2006. His publications include editions of early Tagalog missionary texts, anthologies on Asian theology, and numerous essays in journals and specialized collections. I can imagine many of us have already encountered his writings one way or another. He has assumed leadership roles in academic and religious institutions, including LST. On a personal note, I wanted to say that I consider it a privilege to introduce to you my research collaborator, mentor, academic mentor as well, whose writings have influenced generations of theologians, religious studies scholars, and social scientists. Ladies and gentlemen, I introduce to you all Father Mario Francisco. Father Mario, please. Maraming salamat, Maraming salamat, Dr. Cornelio J. Hill. I want to assure you that this is not a recording and I am not an avatar. Earlier, we did a video recording just in case uh, the internet connections fluctuated. But no, this is live. This is Friday Facebook Live. Allow me to begin by thanking all who have contributed towards this book's publication. Early cheerleaders, first readers and blurb writers, everyone at the university press, so hardworking and even so patient with me. And now all of you at this launch, especially doctors, J.L. Cornelio, uh, Dr. Ruben Mendoza, Dr. Chaley Barry, and Dr. Ray Ileto. This book of 22 essays, written over three decades and practically all published before, are snapshots, selective, incomplete, ready to be photoshopped, focused, on specific texts and issues, drawing from multiple disciplines. It has three sections, translating Christianity, engaging society, and connecting with global Christianity and society. I seem to be rowing on two, if not more, rivers. 
and you remember what the Filipino saying uh, uh, what the Filipino saying is about pamamangka sa dalawang ilo it is certainly exciting but also dangerous my brief remarks do not discuss individual essays but the thematic skeleton the bare bones that support them sometimes discussed explicitly in the essays but more often implicitly they explore the encounter between religions and new contexts as illustrated in the 500 year presence of christianity in the philippines what happens when religious traditions enter new context i will try to address this question through summary statements that we can enflesh during the discussion for many of you perhaps this may sound so up in the clouds but it is important for both the student of religion and the theologian preacher to ask or to wonder how do people in the pews relate to homilies on All Saints Day about Katawan and Kaluluwa? What do they understand? What are these for them? So statement number one, what enters any context is not religion according to some definition, but a particular historical religious tradition shaped and mediated by social forces. This highlights lived religion, the existential and empirical priority of how individuals and groups, you and me, practice religious faith in their life context. Thus, the Christianity that 16th century native society encountered was not Catholicism in conceptual terms, in the abstract, or even from the early church, but its concrete incarnation in late medieval post-Reformation Spanish Catholicism. Second statement. Like many religious traditions, this historical form of Catholicism brought, brought important baggage. First, stories and symbols, hereafter referred to as story. And second, communal processes and institutional structures, hereafter referred to as church, which until recently has been the usual focus of social science and church history. But perhaps more important are foundational stories. For Christianity, this is preeminently the Christ story, told in many texts which offer a narrative framework and implicit logic for the unfolding of communal and personal lives in great diversity. I think that is why we, or Christians, are called followers of Jesus. They follow their story as they follow their own lives. Third statement, in the encounter between religious tradition and context, transmission and reception are intertwined even codependent, to use a contemporary term. But with a preoccupation with missionary intent and power differentials as in colonization, this encounter is often considered unilateral, a native agency of little consequence. It is as if native the natives at the time of the Spanish uh, colonization were passive, where they were just there. They were victims. 
but no, they had their own agency and their own ways of dealing with Spanish colonization, including resistance, but also in many other ways. And thus, the encounter and its outcomes are not solely determined by the transmitter. For example, even recent theology recognizes that what is called the indigenization, enculturation, or contextualization of Christianity has two way processes. For in this multi-directional nature, the primary platform for encounter becomes crucial. In the encounter between Spanish Catholicism and native context, local languages provided the initial and most significant platform. Influenced by earlier Latin American experiences and reflections on using Spanish, the 1682 Synod of Manila instead chose native languages for strategic reasons. And only in the 19th century would this linguistic option become colonial ideology to keep the natives uneducated, as many nationalists pointed out then. Fifth statement, through this linguistic platform, Christian stories and symbols from Spanish Catholicism interacted with the local ethos and took on a native form. And despite missionary concern for fidelity, and I put that in quotes, these languages became proverbial, brought the name into Christian practice. Words and other cultural signs channel emotive connotations, material imagery, and historical associations. And that is why Mary in the Passion, for instance, is the typical Filipino nanay. Iyakin, maaruga, etc. This process could appropriately be called translation. Not a word-for-word -word equivalence, but according to contemporary translation and philosophical studies, as the mediation of social words. This is what led to the emergence of Philippine Christianity. Not a clone of Spanish Catholicism, but a Christianity that is truly embedded in Philippine life and culture. The Passion tradition reflected in the communal reading and social performance of different Passion texts, novenas, and other devotional literature provides the best illustration. Sixth statement, one can speak of the dynamic of Philippine Christianity as it encounters subsequent and changing contexts, like the independent nation state after World War II, or the contemporary, our contemporary globalized world. With these new contexts also come new platforms, nationalist discourse, for instance, or mobility in geographical and digital spaces. For instance, Philippine Christianity especially after that in the second half of the 20th century became what Jose Casanova calls public religion with its imaginary of the Philippines as Catholic nation, the only Catholic nation in Asia. Seventh statement. Because both Philippine Christianity and social contexts are embedded in and interact with multiple social forces, their encounter produces 
diverse, even conflicting social perspectives and practices. Like other foundational narratives, the texts of the Christ story have been followed from all points of the political spectrum. Because of such differences, consensus and unity between, within Christian churches are not already made or finished, but continually recreated in ever-changing context. Eighth, and by way of conclusion, what the foregoing statement suggests is the vibrant dynamic in the encounter between Philippine Christianity and social contexts, though they simply point to the anthology's skeleton, its framework. I hope this would attract you, seduce you to read the essays, which offer snapshots of lived Philippine Christianity. I invite those in the social sciences to explore further the role of religious narrative in social history and individual lives. And those in theological and pastoral studies to always, and I underline that, always begin with how people live their faith in their everyday lives. As expressed in the historic, historic 2021 statement from all Christian churches on the quincentennial, the emergence and unfolding of the faith is what we gratefully celebrate. But this statement also acknowledges that there is much to critique, as Philippine Christianity at various times has also participated in and supported injustice toward those at the margins. Thus, it appropriately ends by recommitting themselves to their marginalized sisters and brothers. How this unfolds in the next 500 years remains to be seen. Good afternoon and thank you for your patience. Thank you very much indeed, Father Mario, for your keynote. Um, I love the word seduction, seduce. <laughs> <laughs> that can only come from a Jesuit. A Jesuit like you. <laughs> the seduction of our audience to, to obtain their own copy of your book and engage it. Ladies and gentlemen, Father Mario covered a great deal in the span of 10 minutes or so. Uh, concepts and ideas spanning everyday religion, translation, the dynamic of um, the dynamic encounter between Philippine Christianity and social contexts. He even talked about Philippine Christianity as a public religion in the 20th century. Things that we are still, phenomena that we are still encountering today. Before we embark on an open forum, what we want to do is we want to hear from reactors, esteemed reactors, uh, theologians and historians, uh, who have engaged Father Mario's work over time, uh, one way or another. We have three, ladies and gentlemen. Let me introduce them to you. The first is uh, Dr. Ruben Mendoza. Professor Ruben Mendoza is a married lay theologian. He is professor and the chair of the Department of Theology of the Ateneo de Manila University. He obtained his undergraduate degree in philosophy from Notre Dame University, his MA in pastoral ministry from Ateneo de Manila, and both his MA in theology and PhD in theology from the Catholic University of Leuven in Belgium. He is presently studying for his MS in bioethics at the University of the Philippines. He is a former president of the Cateo. Many of us are familiar with that organization, the Daming Catolico sa Teologia, the Catholic Theological Society of the Philippines. He is the present president of the International Network of Societies for Catholic Theology, INSECT. 
Our second uh, discussant reactor is Dr. Shelley Barry, who is associate professor at the Institute for Human Rights and Peace Studies at Mahidon University, where she teaches political and social theory and the pol politics of human rights. She has published on the politics of religious identity, Catholicism, and nationalism in the Philippines, as well as literature and cultural politics with a comparative perspective across Thailand, the Philippines, and the U.S. Professor Barry has recently completed a memoir, journalism, essay on motherhood, and the solidarities of protest in Thailand, where she is based. When not watching more Netflix than is advisable, like many others, she worries about the fate of the planet, but places her hope in the possibilities of the human imagination. The third and final reactor, ladies and gentlemen, is Professor Reynaldo Ileto, who is a historian known primarily for his 1979 work, Pasión and Revolution, Popular Movements in the Philippines, 1840 to 1910. Ateneo Press has also published his many other books, Filipinos and Their Revolution, Event, Discourse, and Historiography, and Knowledge and Pacification on the U.S., Conquest and the Writing of Philippine History. As these titles indicate, Professor Ray is known for his interdisciplinary approach to combining history, literature, anthropology, cultural studies, and politics. Many of us are quite familiar with his writings as well. Since graduating with an AD in Humanities from the Ateneo in 1967, Professor Eleto has held many academic positions in numerous universities around the world. His longest tenures uh, were at the University of the Philippines in Binaman, the National University of Singapore, and the Australian National University, where he is currently honorary professor and member of the Emeritus faculty. Ladies and gentlemen, we will be hearing from each of these reactors. And as they share their thoughts, may I invite you to please also share yours uh, via the comment section, of our Facebook Live. Um, I already see many comments coming in and congratulatory remarks. We will be reading uh, them later on, but this is an encouragement to you all to please uh, put in your questions there to engage our uh, keynote speaker and our reactors. Let's begin with Professor Sonny Mendoza. Professor Mendoza, please. Thank you, Chayil. Uh, it is my privilege to be part of this celebration and critique of Art and Mario's book with almost the same title. As one of my professors when I started my studies at the Leola School of Theology, he is an important part of my own theological formation. I do hope that I will be able to contribute meaningfully to our discussion here. Philippine President Rodrigo Duterte appeared as a guest in the show of Pastor Apollo Kibuloy in 2019 when he, Duterte was asked about his plans for the celebration of the quincentenary of the arrival of Christianity, he responded in his typical acrimonious manner when it concerned the institutional Catholic Church. 500 years of Christianity, really? What's so special? I'll celebrate as part of the subjugation of my country for 400 years? You must be kidding. I celebrate the day when the heroes of my country were slaughtered, so on and so forth. While many devout Catholics might probably find Duterte's answers dismissive and offensive, his views are actually shared by others. For instance, Nicolas Valier writes in Rapporteur, and I quote, No, we shouldn't celebrate 500 years of Christianity in our country. To do so would be to spit on the memory of our ancestors. To do so would be to bury their dream for freedom, a dream that we are yet to fully realize. He goes on to claim, the problem we face today are, in effect, mutations of what our ancestors had to deal with centuries ago. To let it all slide, therefore, would not only be a grave insult to them, but would also be an open invitation for even greater oppression. The comments about Duterte and Falier actually bring to light the ambivalence of evangelization during the Spanish colonial period that the spiritual conquests of Indios came hand in hand with military conquests. Scott Appleby refers to the use of religion for political interests as the ambivalence of the sacred. 
The reality is that evangelization during the colonial period took place in what we would now consider questionable circumstances, which created and resulted in historical injustices, the consequences of which we are still experiencing at present. While many, I suspect, would romanticize Spain's legacy and overlook the abuses that came with colonization, any genuine celebration on the part of the Catholic Church ought not to downplay the fact that our ancestors were subjugated and that the Church was actually complicit in the process. Rather, the Catholic Church is a challenge to confront the totality of our Spanish heritage head-on, problematize it, and respond to it humbly and justly. This is sadly an aspect of the commemoration of Christianity's centenary that is sorely missing in the official website of the church hierarchy about it. The question for me is not whether or not we should celebrate Christianity's arrival. Rather, the question is, what does it mean to celebrate it? The Catholic Bishops' Conference of the Philippines has chosen the theme gifted to give for its celebration of this event. While it is true that the majority of Filipinos embraced the Christian faith and rebelled against the Spanish colonial government, we have not really confronted what it calls the treacherous economic and political agenda of the colonists. Part of the reasons why this is so is because the Catholic Church benefited from that agenda. There were travails and agony and sorrow, as the third is stated, during that era. Many of the social issues that we experience at present have their historical roots at that period. If the local Catholic Church is to truly celebrate its giftedness, it needs to critically look at its past and its complicity for situations that resulted to social injustice. It is only when it accepts the shadow of colonization and its attendant consequences and responds to them accordingly that the Catholic community can be truly gifted to give. Give. Its giftedness is not only its being able and bold to share the Catholic faith, but it also includes, more importantly, its contributions in building a more just and inclusive society, writing of historical injustices if needed, with a special preference for the downtrodden and the marginalized. One can actually detect in the CBCP website that is dedicated to the celebration a certain ambivalence. On one hand, we have statements that acknowledge the abuses during the colonial period. On the other hand, there are also items that fail to adequately question the relationship between the sword and the cross at that time. For instance, a section of an article about the history of Christianity in the countries entitled, Spain Conquers the Philippines with a Cross. I don't know about you, but I find the title deeply disturbing. It seems that it does not cross the minds of the author and editor of the site to question the very title and its assumptions. While it's true that the faith was instrumentalized for political purposes, the section's title fails to do justice to the complexity of historical events at that time. To be fair, the part of the narration under that section actually tells the story of church leaders questioning the authority of Spain to colonize the Indios. In using that title, however, the author fails to problematize the use of the cross as a political tool to subjugate the people. This is precisely the problem that the local Catholic Church needs to confront. The Catholic faith was propagated in the context of colonization and was even instrumentalized for political purposes. So one must never really forget that evangelization came with a price. At the outset, it needs to be emphasized that when the Spaniards came to our archipelago, it was not with the primary intention of evangelizing the natives. The Spaniards were not really disinterested parties as they arrived in our islands. They understandably took advantage of Rome's blessings to colonize the world. Just as the crown used to cross, the missionaries at the same time took advantage of the colonial enterprise to spread their message. As Abinales and Amoroso put it, the mission to convert was inseparable from the goal of political pacification. Missionary friars became parish priests, learning local languages and living among their converts in order to translate Christianity into local court cultures and stamp out worship of local spirits. Under their leadership, everyday life was framed and regulated by church teachings and guidelines. The friar was everywhere mobilizing people for state and church work, cajoling their support through sermons and punishing their sins they revealed in confession. Uh, the Jesuit historian 
uh, Schumacher actually presents a reading of the missionary endeavors that is more sympathetic to the church, particularly as the missionaries raise their voices against the abuses committed by the conquistadores, typically to create pains to instruct the converts about the Christian faith and responded to their needs. When George Taylor claims that the colonial, Christ the colonial Christianity failed to question colonialism, mostly because it operated under the tacit assumption that the colonial enterprise was the Christian enterprise, there is more to eat, there is more than meets the eye in the case of the church in the Philippines. I think that it is in this context that we can better appreciate the book of Father Mario Francisco, especially since the discourse of the hierarchy fails to adequately consider the reality of lived religion, a term that is useful for distinguishing the actual experience of religious persons from the prescribed religion of institutionally defined beliefs and practices. It is important to note with Talal Asad that we should not view religion as some transhistorical essence existing as a timeless and unitary phenomenon. As Asad and many others have demonstrated, not only do religions change over time, but also what people understand to be religion changes. In order for us then to better understand the interplay of Catholicism as it was handed on to us by Spanish missionaries, typically using their own culturally and historically conditioned interpretations of the Christian faith and its practices and our local culture, we are invited to seriously study and understand its reception. We need to grapple, as McGuire states, with how to comprehend individuals' religions as practice in all their complexity and dynamism. Too often, our concepts for describing and analyzing individuals' religions simply fail to capture how multifaceted, diverse, and malleable are the beliefs, values, and practices that make up perhaps most persons' own religions. Many speak of Catholicism in its pure form, for lack of a better term, that would be, they would be the magisterial teachings and official liturgy, abstractions really, but the reality is there is no such thing as a pure faith. Its preaching, interpretation, and performance will always be influenced by one's social location, culture, and history. And I do think that Father Mario shows those things clearly in his book. His anthology is a significant contribution to the exploration of the encounter between religion, which in this case is Catholicism, and Philippine context. While he discusses what he refers to as snapshots, there are important considerations in the church's efforts to understand its past in order to be more faithful to the kingdom and to history. Perhaps Francisco's studies and others like it will pave the way for a more honest evaluation of the Christian tradition in our history. With reference to the violence that was done by Christian missionaries on indigenous peoples, Carl Gaspar asks, Magso sorry ba tayo? To say sorry actually is only but the first step in our grappling with our heritage. Thank you. Maraming maraming salamat, Professor Mendoza. Very provocative ending you got there. Magso sorry ba tayo in alluding to Brother Carl Gaspar? We will come back to that point and many the many other points that you raised in your reaction just now. Shall we proceed first to our second reactor? Our second reactor is Professor Chelly Barry, uh, who is based at Mahidon University in Thailand. Professor Barry, your turn. Can you hear? Yes, loud and clear, Professor Barry. Great, thanks. Okay, so to the visible and invisible participants today, each of whom are no doubt esteemed, um, I'd like to say how happy I am to be a part of this event. It's an achievement to bring a manuscript to completion and then launch it into the world. So congratulations, Father Mario, and thank you to Ateneo Press for inviting me to take part. Uh, between celebration and critique is the work of someone whose journey as an intellectual, a scholar, and a teacher has been long, wide-ranging, open to exploration, and anchored uh, in his identity as a Jesuit. The book is both ambitious in scope and modest in tone, 
it's ambitious in that the disciplinary in the disciplinary frameworks it draws upon the time periods and topics taken up 500 years is after all a big chunk of time uh, yet modest in that the voice of the author does not generally announce itself this particular reader found herself at points wishing that the author would shout out loud or shift to capital letters so i would not be left guessing at meanings or implications. Nonetheless, the spirit of engagement through which I approach this book and my reactions to it are one of respect. What follows are just a handful of thoughts and feelings of this reactor, necessarily truncated and scattered, but I hope still useful. Some thoughts on the first section. The Tagalog sources which appear more extensively in this section than in other parts of the book are drawn upon in ways that enrich and ground the analyses and arguments. Equally striking, they evidence a love of the literary depths of this language. I'm not sure that the Trojan horse analogy works, uh, the one that was invoked earlier to describe the languages that quote, brought the native world into Christian practice such that native voices became empowered to speak of and to God in their native tongues. What battle was won here? If the Trojan horse analogy is extended more fully, I'm not sure, but perhaps I'm being overly literal in understanding how that phrase is used. No matter, Francisco's application of translation studies, concepts and methods on the multi-directionality of meaning in the missionary conversion experience is very suggestive. And post-colonialism's promise of offering alternative perspectives and uh, lives, oh sorry, uh, lives and breathes throughout the book, invoking new readings of old texts, critically challenging narratives that were discriminatory, racist, and or not terribly interesting to newer generations of readers and scholars. I noted previously about the book that there's an openness that comes from using this concept of story. The word and the concept are certainly a major, if not a dominant trope. Fun fact, the word um, story appears 429 times in the book. And we have uh, Adobe, of course, helped with the counting of that. And when I saw that, um, after having actually read the book in um, different lights, and it really did give me more pause for thought. So the author adopts, uh, rather opts for the terms church and story to capture both the institutional and the social and symbolic dimensions of Philippine Christianity. Readers are invited to consider and reassess many moments in the Philippines past and present in which the story informed individual and collective actions of people moving within their times and locales. The story is the Christ story, and this anthology regards it as both embedded heritage as well as a touchstone for Filipinos as they move in the world. The choice of critique rather than criticism for the title of this book seems to emphasize a perspective um, about that draws our attention to things as they are and things as they might be, rather than making bold ju judgments about what is not working. Certainly by the third section of the book, the diminished role that the church qua church plays, that is to say, not faith more widely, um, in the lives of Filipinos can be accepted and even celebrated when evaluated and critiqued through sociological or socio-religious lenses. Another word I counted, just for fun, that's something I, I, I do from time to time. Uh, the word power appears about 200 times. Uh, sometimes it's the cognate empower, empower or empowered. Unsurprisingly, perhaps, this is most frequently, it appears most frequently in the second section of the book, Engaging Society. And if we had more time today, I would gladly spend some of it on this concept. For now, I would like to just say that transdisciplinary and multidisciplinary approaches can be very helpful 
But when it comes to dealing with power, the social sciences, in my view, diverge in significant ways, not least of all in their methods. And in the study of religion, as in the field of human rights studies, into which I migrated uh, myself in uh, my time in Thailand, and which, by the way, are, by the way, shares some of the normative qualities of theology and religious studies to some degree. These conceptual and analytic borrowings are commonplace and often celebrated. While there can be insights that we might not otherwise arrive at by using precisely these mixed disciplinary, transdisciplinary perspectives, it also seems to me that there are risks of slippages and, and some of these slippages could be fruitfully teased out in some of the chapters of this book. So I'm going to um, wind this down by simply saying that um, it's been said that some grain of resistance seems necessary to irritate a liking into a capacity for writing. And I wonder, did these grains animate Father Mario? I'd like to think so. And I would like to imagine many other readers of this book who may take from their own resistance and irritate their own likings to more and new writings in response. I think I'll end it there. Thank you very much, Professor Barry. That's a very helpful way of uh, framing our conversation perhaps this afternoon. What irritates people? What irritates Father Mario? What irritates the uh, readers? Um, irritations that can actually be very productive. I, I, I thought that was very insightful. Okay, we'll come back to you, Professor Barry, in a bit. Um, at this point, we have our third reactor is uh, Professor Ray Eletto. We introduced him just now, but just to give you um, a, a quick reminder, he is a historian. We know many of his writings, known primarily for his 1979 work, Passion and Revolution, Popular Movements in the Philippines, 1840 to 1910. He is currently based at the uh, Australian National University, where he is currently honorary professor and member of the Emeritus Faculty. Professor Eletto, your turn, please. Okay. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Sorry. Um, yeah, I sorry. I just had to rush back from uh, another engagement. Um, and I, uh, I, I've sort of uh, written a very short um, commentary on the, 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 the paper that um, Father Mario read earlier, which which I was given a copy of. Um, I don't know what the other reactors have said, but let me just read out my notes, and uh, we'll see what what others uh, think about my comments. Um, let me start by congratulating Father Mario and the Ateneo Press for publishing this very timely and valuable collection of essays. When I first heard of uh, Father Mario's book or book project um, some years ago, I was very excited about it because in recent years, I've been asking myself, what constitutes the civilization that we Filipinos belong to? Because we're, we're entering a new era in in international relations or global politics where civilization matters more than ideologies. And I keep on going back to those 350 years of Spanish rule when Catholic communities were formed and the Spanish missionary and later the Spanish friar became the most important figure in the community. Um, I've written uh, some essays about um, the Spanish friar and his relationship with the mayor, because I think that's a very key relationship in our, in our history that, in fact, uh, has a 
bearing on how contemporary politics has developed. Um, but that's uh, that's for another uh, session to discussing the role of the mayor. But uh, I've been interested in the role of the of the uh, the fraile. Um, how did Filipinos in the past or the Indios actually experience life in a Catholic pueblo under the guidance and leadership of a Spanish friar? Unfortunately, we still don't have a history book that captures the lived experience of the Indios in the 17th and 18th centuries. Uh, but what about results no limitangere, how you say, or you ask? Well, yes, what it narrates about San Diego is captivating and useful, but only in the context of the late 19th century, when some Catholic Pueblos were being agitated by liberal and modernist ideas brought in by educated illustrados, like Rizal himself, who picked them up in Manila and, and of course, uh, other places like um, Madrid and uh, Paris, not to mention Hong Kong, which was an outpost of the British Empire. Well, we really have very little sense of what it must have felt to be converted to Catholicism by the missionaries and to live the Roman Catholic faith in the context of Spanish colonialism. The very mention of the word, word colonialism already imposes a somewhat negative meaning onto this experience. And of course, the political implications of the term frailocracy applied to the Filipinas by Marcelo del Pilar totally turns this era into a dark age. So why celebrate the coming of Spanish Christianity when it would only lead to, the, lead to this? Um, the problem is that um, our perception of the 16th to mid 19th centuries is negatively influenced by the historiography of the late 19th century, the generation of Rizal and Mabini, and also by the uh, American um, officials and educators and missionaries who wrote about the Philippines in the early 20th century, and also the uh, writings of the current Filipino heirs of the 19th century nationalist project. Father Mario's book is timely because it reminds us of the need to investigate and understand how Christianity in the Philippines was shaped by social forces, how it was actually lived. The word lived experience is used several times in Father Mario's book. By the way, I, I haven't read all of the book. I just read um, mainly the earlier chapters. Um, and so I, um, I, I, I cannot claim to, to uh, have um, grasped the entirety of uh, Father Mario's collection of essays. In any case, uh, these are just my thoughts on the, uh, on the chapters I've read. Uh, Father Mario emphasizes the contributions of sociology, anthropology, and fieldwork experience in bringing to light the actual life context in which the Christ story was internalized. But the challenge he raises, at least in the early chapters of the book that I've read, is how to capture lived experience when field work is no longer possible. How can we imagine from the meager historical data available to us how life was in the early Christian settlements? And of course, uh, with the way um, Sp Spanish is not being taught the Filipinos any longer, or has been or has not been taught for some time, um, our connection with the Spanish linguistic world, you know, has dropped considerably considerably since my uh, experience as a student in the in the fifties and sixties. It's a long time ago. Uh, so it's even more difficult now than it used to be uh, fifty years ago when I started my career to imagine how life was in the early Christian settlements or in the middle of the Spanish colonial era. You know, we, uh, we simply cannot imagine or understand any longer how our forefathers 
actually related to the Spanish cura paroco or the fraile. And it's all too easy to simply read back in time Marcelo del Spilar's assertions about the bad friars. But uh, I can remember even in my conversations with my grandparents, even my, my parents and my very religious aunt, that um, the late Spanish period wasn't at all what didn't seem to be, uh, didn't seem to be what, um, what uh, some historians have pictured it to be in the light of uh, reading Rizal's novels. In any case, um, instead, of, instead of taking the easy way out, uh, Father Mario challenges us to understand the, Christ the Christianity brought by the missionaries in the context of the late medieval post-Reformation Spain, as, as he puts it. Um, so there's a, a lot of work is, is, is needed in order to contextualize what happened in the uh, in the 16th to 18th centuries, and uh, I just feel uh, you know watching all of the uh, Queen Centennial celebrations and all the, and all and all that that um, we haven't been doing enough homework in trying to understand this past because we already have a preconceived notion of what it was it you know what it was all about, and certainly in my generation. You know, in the in the in the late sixties and early seventies, um, I I was, you know, I, I formed a quite negative view of Spanish colonial rule, and I tried to rescue something out of it, something positive from it, by looking at uh, certain aspects of the localization of the uh, Christian message uh, propagated by the missionaries. Anyway, I, in the past, um, I never thought of investigating the life worlds of the Spanish priests who came to live in the Philippines for over three centuries. What kind of a community existed under the leadership of the friar? We tend to avoid this question because the big man here is a foreigner uh, and a Spaniard. But in the context of lived Catholicism, as Father Mario keeps on emphasizing in his, in his essays, and casting aside the nationalist mindset, which, uh, you know, the, which uh, uh, formed my own um, impressions of, of this particular part of our history, what did the Spanish priest actually stand for and what did he accomplish? Was it not a unique Filipino lowland Christian civilization that he helped to construct. As mentioned by Father Mario, the 1682 Manila Synod decided that the native languages and not Spanish should be used as the linguistic platform for the propagation of the faith. Was it not a positive development that Spanish priests had to learn our language instead of imposing their language on their flock as the Americans would do, as Americans would do to Filipino students after 1900. It was only in Rizal's time that this option to use the vernacular languages was criticized as an ideological ploy by the Spaniards to keep the natives uneducated. By projecting this liberal view backwards in time, we lose sight of the creative effects of preaching Christianity and living Christianity in the vernaculars. Um, Father Mario doesn't say much about the Spanish priest side of the story as well, but this is implied in his methodology of treating religion as social process. What he does develop quite fully is how Christianity was received and internalized by the receivers or the audience of the Spanish priests. Not being, historian, not being a historian himself, he has drawn upon my earlier work and Vince Raphael's writings on translation in developing the notion of the Christ story as the basis of, quote, a narrative framework and implicit logic for the unfolding of communal and personal lives in great diversity, unquote. For most Filipinos, according to Father Mario, 
the recognition of Christ's story and its associated symbols has been more important than contact with church institutions or groups. The Christ story was developed in all of the Filipino pueblos throughout the archipelago, despite the vernacular, despite the variety of vernacular languages in which it was platformed, to use another term that Father Mario uses in his book, the common Christ story assured that the regions would be bound by a common thread, a common social epic, foreign in origin, but embedded in lived experience in Filipinas. Rizal would become a national hero even before the Americans arrived because his death was recognized as Christ-like in all of the regions you know, that uh, was encompassed by uh, Spanish rule. Father Mario's book documents and heralds the dynamism of Philippine Christianity in his encounter with subsequent and changing contexts, like the independent nation state after World War II or the contemporary globalized world, unquote. New contexts and new platforms would pose new challenges to confront. And that is how the story of Philippine Christianity has developed up to 2021. I can see the point in Father Mario's conclusion about the need for Christian churches to recommit themselves to the poor and marginalized people. But just as, but just as important, I think, is to reimagine our history as one in which the so-called Spanish colonial era is not a dark age, as the American influence historiography of the early 20th century emphasized. By looking instead at context and lived experience, as Father Mario does in his book, surely we can begin to memorialize this era in a positive way. So these are just my random uh, thoughts about the few chapters of the book that I have read and also the, uh, the talk that Father Mario gave at the beginning of this session. Thank you very much. Maraming salamat, Professor Ray. Um, it's good to have you here as well. Uh, shortly, we are going to begin our open forum. We are already receiving some questions from you. Please keep them coming, your thoughts, your ideas, even your questions, uh, not just to Father Mario, but to our other, to our other uh, reactors as well. From the keynote to the reactions, I think there's a golden thread that runs through each of them, each of the talks that we heard today. And I think that's the emphasis on everyday religion mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. with different permutations in the form of, say, reception, in the form of resistance, in the form of um, uh, translation. We heard that as well. Um, and and uh, in the context of subjugation as a um, as, uh, Professor Mendoza pointed out I, uh, when he spoke. These are ideas that are very, uh, uh, very clear in the book that Father Mario, that we are launching today. Obviously, there are many other strands of thought in the text itself, you know, globalization to which um, Professor Ileto alluded as well, um, and many ideas that could also be covered if we had enough time. Meanwhile, for now, let's focus on these ideas. Let's bring back in uh, Father Mario, and maybe he has some comments to say. He has some reactions to the uh, to the discussion that we heard just now, and then we will be uh, reading the questions from the audience. Father Mario, do you want to say yes, something okay. first? Yeah, sure. Just, uh, well, the first thing that I want to say is I'm, I don't know the right word, mortified or consoled, but I'm certainly uh, thankful for the thoughts and the ideas that uh, the different reactors uh, uh, shared. And I certainly agree with, the, with, with them in, you, you know, in, in to a large part, if not if not completely, uh, I, I my concern or you know what was what was I what are my 
uh, pet peeves. What drove me to, uh, I mean, to put that in terms of Dr. Barry's question. Certainly, doing the kind of theology or even any study of religion that does not come from below, so to speak. So, and, and, and that's why it's, it's very important. I certainly, for example, agree with, uh, with uh, Dr. Mendoza's uh, uh, critique of precisely the, the collusion and collaboration of uh, church leaders in, uh, you know, in the oppression of, of indigenous peoples and so forth and so on. But the church was, was not then and now simply those leaders. And so it is important to pay attention to how did the Indios, to use uh, you, you know that term, how how did they live? How did they receive uh, what 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 was transmitted to them? And this is this is where I strongly react also in in the book uh, to looking at the native as victims and all that it implies because uh, somebody is a victim when that person or group of people are robbed of precisely agency. The, I, I insist, and again, borrowing from post-colonial and so forth studies, I insist that the natives ha had their own ways of dealing with it. Uh, uh, and so that, 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 that's why it is, it is important to emphasize that the question of agency, the, as uh, you know, an old book, Scott, which I, which I mentioned, the weapons of the weak, everyday resistance and so forth and so on of peasants. I think it is important for us to examine. I'm, th there is no denial, certainly, of the collusion of church leaders and so forth in, in the colonial project, but at the same time, you you have to look at how the people received it and by re by receive that also means resistance by by running away the remontados by by looking at uh by uh doing uh, other things uh vince rafael and other uh, other scholars who have studied uh have studied uh confessionals, the penitentials, precisely by using the language and having confessions in, in the native languages, the natives had the upper hand. That's what I meant by the Trojan horse. In spite of the fact that the missionaries were saying, oh, we should uh, not accept anything idolatrous and make sure that the language, Christianity that we practice and encourage is pure. No, they could not control that simply because the language brought in that whole ethos of uh, the native world. Okay, let me stop there. Thank you. Okay, great. Marami salamat, Father Mario. Um, I also invite our reactors to please just jump in anytime uh, in the conversation if you if you wish. So just um, uh, we're not going to take it as rude. Uh, para naman interactive yung ating conversation. Okay, we've got we've got time for a few questions. Okay, let's start with one question from Ma'am Karina Bolasco. So she cites, as Philippine Christianity at various times has also participated in and supported injustice toward and exclusion of those at the margins, it appropriately ends by recommitting themselves to their marginalized sisters and brothers. Ang tanong, does this refer to the position the CBCP has taken in the coming May elections. How do you think the flock will receive this? Does anyone want to respond to that question? Let's start with Father Mario. Father Mario. No, well, I I, I think so. Uh, uh, okay. Church, church discourse. Right? By, by this, I mean official uh, discourse from the leaders of the church have have always uh, spoken about the preferential option of the, for the poor, for the marginalized, and so forth and so on, which is fine, uh, which sometimes can degenerate, if I may use that word, uh, into motherhood statements. Again, I, 
I, I, I use that word in quotation marks because that may be pejorative. Okay. But in other words, but at the same, so I don't think any church leader, Catholic, Evangelical, or Protestant will say we should not take care of the poor and we should not pay attention to the, we should not pay attention, we should pay attention to the marginalized. I think that. Now, how that translates into specific choices, let's say, regarding the election, whether to participate in the election, whether to campaign for partic a particular candidate or not, and so, or to, to campaign against another candidate. Those are steps. Those are steps. And the, in one of the essays in the second, uh, in the second uh, section, engaging society. Uh, I think the, this is a section on on uh, the reproductive health bill. My my beef, okay, if I may say that, with the official statements of the CBCP on that subject, and even on the question of uh, nationalism, is that the process of reaching a particular action or a particular conclusion or position has always been deductive this is what the bible says this is what uh this is what uh you know the documents of vatican to uh uh say etc etc and then after that it is applied and they use applied here in the way you know, you apply the recipe in making banana cake. No, not so not apply in the sense of Gadamer, but rather it is deductive. Okay, these are the principles that uh, scripture and church teaching that tells us, and therefore we apply. Whereas what, what I'm arguing for is precisely, but it is not one way. I'm not saying you should throw away the Bible and throw away the teachings of the church, I'm saying, what does the contemporary experience, the lived religion from below, what does it say? And because what it says can challenge, can clarify, can even refine uh, uh, precisely what the church has taught. For instance, I mean, this is often used. There was a time when the church, church, uh, the Catholic church said, that uh, collecting interest rates on loans is immoral. It was the experience and the uh, of, of Catholic economists that made the church, uh, the church, the official church, change that teaching. So there should be that, and there is that. Father Mario. You're making very important points, no? Let's bring in si Dr. Mendoza. Dr. Mendoza is part of the Cateo. I'm not gonna, I'm not, I'm not putting you on the spot, no, Sir Sani. But I think it's very important because the Cateo made a clear endorsement, right, of a, of a, of President, uh, Vice President Lenny Robredo for for presidency. And I think that's where Mam Karina is coming from with her question. Are endorsements like that really? Um, I mean, I'm reading into it now. Um, helpful, useful, especially in the light of what Father Mario said. What do you think, uh, uh, Sir Sunny? Yeah, um, yeah um, I, do think that, I, do think that, I do think that the church has to retain the church has to retain emphatic voice with regard to those issues. So the endorsement of the Catholic Theological Society of the Philippines is in line with that particular uh, particular mission of the church. Uh, it sees that uh, given the circumstances of politics and the people in our country nowadays, then it needs to say something. It cannot remain silent, given the forces of historical revisionism, forces of fake news and the like. Um, the organization society has to take a stance about those issues. And as a response, it is endorsing the candidacy of Vice President Progreto. Even if, Sir Sani, even if um, people may not necessarily appreciate it, I see yeah, comments yeah, on yeah. social media, Padre Damaso, hypocrisy, and the like. 
yeah, uh, uh, actually many people would endorse, no, uh, and wrongly, I think, the separation of church and state since uh, that particular endorsement of being the candidate. But if it's their candidate, it's okay for them. No? Uh, but then even if uh, nobody said that the prophets were accepted in their own countries, prophets were not uh, uh, popular. I'm not saying that we are prophets, but the in continuation of this prophetic voice of uh, that is found in the Christian tradition, then Christians, Christian communities, Christian groups must speak about those what it perceives as forces that promote uh, intolerance, violence, you know, dishonesty, so all those things. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Sonny. We've got another question, and maybe we can hear from Professor Ray and uh, Professor Barry as well. Um, how do the Filipino Christian adjacent denominations like Agipayan, Jesus Miracle Crusade, Iglesia Ni Cristo, the Rizalistas, Dating Daan, maybe you can include here Apollo Kiboloi, Kingdom of Jesus Christ, uh, very controversial, fit in the arc of Christian history in the Philippines in the context of the book. Padre Mari, that's also my question. You know, I, I do a lot of work on Catholicism, but I do a lot of work too on other Christian denominations, Christian churches. Does your book open up conversations about other Christian traditions? Let's hear from you first, Brother Mario, and then we'll hear from uh, uh, Professor Shelley and Professor Ray. Okay, yeah, I'll be I'll be brief. Uh, the, uh, definitely, that's why in 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 the first part of the book, the first the opening pages, I I, I precisely uh, say that. The history of the story of Philippine Christianity has not been has not been written. It's so incomplete, and I say, and by that I mean all the these groups, the the evangelicals, the uh, you know the Aglipayans, the Jesus, they are part of Philippine Christianity to that I mean to 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 a greater or lesser extent, and therefore they should be part of the story. So that that that's one. Second, that's why I highlight the unfortunately largely unknown uh, historic document uh, published uh, last year, 2021. It's just one page. It's called One Ecumenical Family. It is the statement of the all the Christian churches, Catholic, Protestant, mainline Protestant, Evangelical uh, leaders and churches, uh, do, doing a common statement on the meaning of the uh, Queen Centennial, which is so much more uh, solid theologically and historically solid in contrast to the own CBCP statement on, on the Queen Centennial. Uh, just to add, uh, you know, this is a joke. Uh, uh, Dr. Barry said that I should give jokes uh, during <laughs> during this session. This joke is: Can you imagine? It's it says when Magellan came in, Magellan came in as a conquistador, okay. But then when he saw the 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 natives and how receptive they were, then he became a missionary. And then when the natives started. Uh, started, um, you know, demand, making their demands. Then he became a conquistador, and then uh, the CBCP statement says, "Well, you know, uh, those who who bring the gospel are earthen vessels. Also, they are human. This is not theologically sound. This is not historically sound. So, end of the joke." <laughs> Oh, let's hear from, that's funny, Prof, no, Father Mario. Let's hear from Professor Chelly, because I am very familiar with Professor Chelly's work, you know, women religious and their activism in the 1970s in the wake of Vatican II. Would you like to comment on what Father Mario said and also in relation to the rise of other um, aggressive religious groups now, especially in, in, in this time, politics and all that? Yeah, I'll try. I don't know. Um... I would say a couple of things. One is that the kinds of charisms that I located in studying women religious groups um, in the 
the sort of early 90s and stuff certainly felt to me it shared a great deal with in the um in the spirituality traditions um and this and the sense of um the um the ease with which people will navigate um their their interpretations and giving meaning to um this kind of the agency that 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 father mario has mentioned it seems to me that that a vein or those veins continue as, as strongly as ever and so for me it was a just as a um a device of uh for for research and analysis it was a very it always felt to me those continuities were speaking very loudly I mean, I, you know just on a personal note those also those um movements in 19th and early 20th century were a real interest of mine um for a long period of time so yeah so it seemed to me to be more continuous um and i will um i'm not sure i i always think there i'm not i don't think jokes necessarily sorry <laughs> carry very well um <laughs> but on a semi-serious note i just think people get if you're, if you're asking me to comment to the reading statements that are put together by theologians and bishops is something i i cannot do i learned that very early on and i just and i do feel that people get a special place in heaven if there is one for doing so and and father mario does but last but not least is to the questioner i think her name was um cynthia lynn um the, the question put to us is is, is this in the books and i want to say buy the book or read the book and just put a plug in for getting the book and seeing what you think yourself oh uh, thanks professor Shelley, for marketing the book for us <laughs> sir ray your turn hey all what do you think is there a space for other Christian traditions in the Christian history of the Philippines? Well, I, I, I have a rather different view of our history with regards to that question. I, um, I believe that uh, there was a very serious break or a, you know, a, a big break in our history with the coming of the Americans and the um, expulsion of the friars. I think that was, and the, the, um, the effects of that break uh, are still being felt today. And one of the uh, serious consequences of, 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 of this situation is that we really do not understand the Spanish period anymore. I think the earlier generation of historians, Filipino historians, even during the American period still understood what everyday life was under the Spanish period. But the farther we are away from that, the more we are, we have internalized what I feel is a very American construction of, of our 350 years of history under Spain. And I, I, I see a lot of uh, implications for this, for this uh, break, uh, of this big break in our history uh, in contemporary politics, but I need to prepare myself for another session before I speak out on this, because I have very different ideas about who I think you know, about, about yeah. the coming elections. And uh, even though I am a graduate of the Ateneo, I don't think I would be welcomed um, if I spoke my mind about uh, my views about the present, but I prefer I prefer to talk about the past and to write about the past and let readers um, figure out the implications of what I'm saying about history for the present. And and I think my recent book, I hate to talk about my book when you're supposed to talk about Father Mario's book, but, but I think that uh, a lot of the things I have written about in my most recent Ateneo Press book uh, have yet to be digested and connected to what is happening today, but I think it will eventually come. So my my uh, basically my my uh, my response to this to this uh, question is that um, it's it's um, it's based on my understanding that there's been a, a, a great discontinuity in our history, including the history of Philippine Christianity from Spanish Catholicism to 
to a kind of mixture that the Americans actually intentionally meant to happen in the Philippines. Because don't forget, the American Revolution was was actually produced by Freemasons and, and Protestants. And the first American president who was a Catholic was Kennedy, who, who was killed by his own people. So it's not, you know, uh, the colonial ruler that supplanted Spain was hostile to Roman Catholicism. And we still have to come to terms with the effects of this because um, the effects of this have been covered up by all of the positive things that are said about Spanish, uh, about American colonial rule and the construction of a very negative Spanish era that allows for American imperialism to be seen as almost a, you know, a, a gift to the Filipino people to lift us out of uh, the backward you know, and uh, uh, the dark age of Spanish rule. So I, I'm proceeding from that reinterpretation of history, which so has which so many has... implications for the present that I, I just cannot handle specific issues properly it's about the present. About the present. Yeah, yeah. But Professor Ray, just a, just a quick follow up before I ask Professor Sani to comment on this exact same question. Hindi ba pwedeng tingnan din na it's not, it wasn't just so much about the Americans. I mean, I understand the point that you're making. The Americans really playing a big role in antagonizing the Catholic Church and the Spanish regime and so forth. But all, many indigenous churches at the time were also anti-Catholic. Um, the Aglipayan, for example, or Iglesia Ni Cristo, for that matter, thoroughly anti-Catholic throughout the 20th century. Would that That's already 20th century. I'm talking about the turn, century. Century. The turn of the century. Oh, turn of the century. Got it. Okay. Okay. Well, before before well, before, before this before, other before religions this other came religions, into being, including the, religion, uh, including the uh, the uh, independent yeah. Philippine independent church, the Kepayan. that was already an effect of the Philippine American War. So the the Philippine American War is a turning like, point, and the more I the closer I look at the Philippine American War, the more I realize that it was a religious war, that a lot of the appeals made by those who held out against uh, against the Americans was actually religious. And it's not surprising that there are all of these religious political leaders that emerged after the war and, and, and you know, with names like Santa Iglesia. It's almost like they're, you know, they're, they're trying to keep afloat, uh, you know, uh, a civilization that had just been kind of uh, given a big smash, you know, in, in the head by, by American forces. But anyway, uh, I, I think that... Uh, um, I, what I'm really pointing out is the lack of research on certain topics and certain aspects of Philippine history because they're not they, they, they don't provide you with instant rewards like a tenure tenure position in a university you know if you take up certain topics that are uh, not uh, conducive to what the current world order uh, wants you to do and I've I've experienced that in my own career actually of not saying what people like to hear anyway I'll stop at that. Yeah, fair enough, Professor Ray. Sir Sani, as a theologian, how would you make sense of other Christian traditions? I think this is, again, one of the questions that I think this book is really asking the audience now. Yeah, I, I ordinarily I'm more ecumenical in my approach you know, with regard to other Christian traditions. Um, I suppose I take to heart you know, the, the teachings of Vatican II with regard to that, uh, particularly in Unitatis Redinse Grasso, in its call to engage in ecumenical dialogue. Yeah, of course, while the Catholic Church has become more ecumenical in its approach, uh, uh, there is still much room for improvement. Uh, on one hand, yeah, it would be ecumenical, but then there seems to be the, the more fundamentalist Christian traditions in the Philippines nowadays, for instance, the Iglesia Ni Cristo and many of the evangelicals are not really ecumenical. So, so there's a big challenge. No? How do you promote Christian unity in that sense? Correct. Lovely. And one more just... Okay. okay. Please. Just an addition. Uh, just as we need to problematize the Spanish colonial heritage, of course, I do agree with uh, Professor Leto that we need also to problematize the American colonial heritage. There's no question about that. Uh, we question the, the effects of Spanish Catholicism. We also need to question uh, the Protestantism that the Americans brought to us and its implications to, 
uh, Catholic Filipino Catholic practices. Exactly, exactly. And in my own work, and Pastor Sunny, I'm really interested in the present day evangelicalism, for example, fundamentalism, and all this resistance to ecumenism uh, and its implications on on politics. Let me just read one last comment from our audience. It's a, a provocative comment, and then we will hear from Father Mario to wrap this up, and then and then we will close this. Okay, Mero is some comment. This is from Jethro Kalatday, who's a PhD student in history right now. Um, sabi niya, I think Francisco is correct in saying that the history of Christianity in the Philippines is still unwritten. Sabi niya, case in point, the 1969 anthology of Gerald Anderson and its successor, the 2002 anthology edited by Quantes. As it is now, ecumenical history is still disconnected. I think rightly agreeing also with um, uh, what we heard just now. White Anglo-Saxon, uh, sorry, uh, uh, written along denominational lines. Yeah. I have to disagree respectfully with Professor Eleto Sabinya, new work on Catholicism in American Empire, especially Catherine Moran's The Imperial Church, Cornell 2020, looks at the importance of um, Catholicism in American expansion. White Anglo Saxon Protestants found common ground with Roman Catholics precisely because of American expansion. As my comment then, si, uh, si Sir uh, si Al Alegre. Uh, referring to this document on ecumenical family. Shall we hear from you, Father Mario, your last words? For this yeah, event? well, I, I think the most important word is uh, thank you for, as, as I said at the beginning, to all who contributed to this publication, not only the press, not only uh, those who wrote, but also everybody who showed, who showed interest. And Certainly, our discussion this afternoon has, has uh, shown that at least it has opened some doors. And I invite everybody who is interested in religion, in Philippine uh, Christianity, in its history, in the sociology of religion, and of course, my brothers and sisters, uh, seminarians, priests, and so forth, who preach to reflect on, to reflect on precisely and to study critically our, how we live our, our Christianity. So once again, thank you very much to everyone and maraming maraming salamat po at hanggang sa patuloy na paglalakbay nating lahat. Maraming maraming salamat din, Father Mario. Thank you so much for this very important book. Personally, ako ang pinapahalagahan ko sa writings ninyo, yung critical take ninyo on uh, nationalism, you know, re reading the country, the, the Philippine nation as a as a Christian nation, you know, at least as far as official texts are concerned. Uh, and its implications, obviously, on politics. May announcement lang po ako para sa ating lahat, mga kasama, mga kapati, ladies and gentlemen. As promised earlier, we have a special book discount promo for you. I already saw somebody commenting that there's a 15% discount uh, via Shopee and Lazada. But anyway, here's the announcement. Between celebration and critique, this book will be offered at 15% off starting today, February 18, until the 20th. So you have got today, 19, and the 20th until Sunday. Interested buyers, buyers will just need to go to Ateneo University Press's online stores sa Shopee at sa Lazada to purchase. If you have other inquiries, just email the Ateneo Press at books.unipress at ateneo.edu. Books.unipress at ateneo.edu for any inquiries about purchasing this book. Box, siguro. Again, between celebration and critique, will be offered at 15% off starting today. Maraming maraming salamat po sa inyo, Father Mario, Professor Ray, Dr. Shelly Barry, Sir Sonny. It's a wonderful collegial community of religion scholars, you know, historians and social scientists and theologians. You use the word ecumenism. I think our work is very ecumenical in the, in the, more, in the broadest sense of the word. Okay. Maraming maraming salamat po sa lahat ng mga kasama natin sa hapon na ito. Many of you really participated. Thank you so much for sticking around. We hope that you would also share this launch, uh, the link uh, to other colleagues who might be interested in what we discussed today. This has been a very, very productive session. Okay, have a good weekend, everyone. Please stay safe. Uh, 
sa atin po mga professor sa Ateneo. See you all in March. We're all going back to campus in March. See you and take care. God bless you all. Salamat po, Father Mario. Salamat. Thank you, Jail. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.